I hope you do not have a happy Christmas. I was uneasy saying that. It's a risky thing to say, especially this being my first Christmas Eve service here with you all. But that doesn't mean I don't have Christmas cheer. Before you hear that greeting and start imagining that I will be visited by three ghosts tonight, <laughs> please realize that I say this in all Christian love and concern for our mutual relationship with God. My inspiration for this tiding of not happiness is from Luke. It's from Matthew. And normally we speak in polite company, in hushed tones when we talk about unwed teenage mothers. Yet here we are with Mary's age and marital status figuring prominently in this story. So when I say I hope you don't have a happy Christmas, I have all of our interest in mind. If Christmas is merely happy, it doesn't do justice to the story. It doesn't do justice to what we've been celebrating. It doesn't do justice to what we've been acting out and singing about and thinking about this entire season. We've been looking ahead to God being here on Christmas Day. But when God came to Bethlehem, it wasn't like a glossy, fluffy, hallmark movie. When God came to earth, it was real. Mary and Joseph took an arduous journey. They experienced heartless people who slammed doors in their faces. This was the absolute face of need. Now we have sanitized their struggle. We, we sing away in the manger. But Mary's teenage pregnancy carried the scandalous whiff of infidelity. How did it happen, Mary? Can you explain this a little bit? Can you fill in some of the gaps, please? Thank you very much. I don't know if you can see my foot tapping, but it's there for effect. Even back then, they knew where babies came from. So no one was assuming an immaculate conception. The story sounds a bit more Jerry Springer than Hallmark. When they couldn't find a room, Mary and Joseph probably were frightened beyond belief. What are we going to do now? There may have been times when we've faced uncertainty, frightened about some circumstances. There may have been times when we looked ahead and we thought to ourselves, I know it's going to be all right. I can rationally say this is going to work out. Yet even in that moment, there's anxiety. And until it does work out, we have that anxiety and carry it with us. The manger set aside their anxiety for just a second. The manger probably smelled, and I only say probably because of my limited experience in barns, but I can say from every experience I have ever had in a barn, they all smell like a barn. The Gospel of Matthew tells us about some seriously sinister Christmas presents from some shady sorcerers. We don't think about it that way. We think of all in the mid and the night visitors and, and the gift of licorice, which I can't find in the gospel. We think of these pleasantly dressed characters that we place in our mangers. Myrrh, for example, is a commodity in the funeral trade. We, we see the symbolism. We, we do. Today, it's easy. Well, this was to foreshadow his death and the glory of his resurrection. But if we put ourselves in Mary's shoes, or lack thereof, remember, she couldn't even find a place to stay. If we put ourselves there with Mary, it'd be a bit like having your first child and realizing that somebody's just brought a gift for the baby. It's wrapped the person who brought it might be a little bit suspect, but after you open it, you realize it's a bottle of embalming fluid. Yeah, it sounds funny, except I've got some decorative myrrh in my office to celebrate the season. 
The scene ends with Herod's infanticide, mother's wailing, and a terrified flight into the desert. This is the unedited truth of the greatest story ever told, and in every sense, it isn't fun. Family entertainment. It's the story of how God came to be with us. God real, God tangible, God here. This is the story about how God interacts with the world, loves the world, and redeems the world. It's a story with a happy ending, and it's a story that is full of joy and love and peace and hope and all of these other things that we celebrate at church and in this season. But it isn't happy. Consider the shepherds. One more ghastly night in the chilly hills of Syria, this motley crew stood watch in their field, looking over their sheep. These aren't the types of people you'd invite home for dinner. Not unless we were going to have them bathe first. And suddenly, in their midst, in the chill of the air, and the ugliness of that scene, we're picturing the past images in our minds but it wasn't like that the sky lights up with an angelic choir and they're singing this rough and tumble crew of shepherds is terrified we, we have this advantage of hindsight we know how the story's going to end I don't want to ruin tomorrow but the baby makes it I don't want to ruin the ending, but the tomb was empty. But we're not there yet. We're seeing these events as if they, having already heard that it's going to be okay. Jesus grows up, teaches amazing lessons. But the shepherds were simply going along in what was already a very difficult life. When these angels show up and light up the sky, singing glory to God in the highest, in the mystique of Christmas celebrations, pageantries, and our own tradition, it's easy to miss out on the significance of their response. They might have been the first ones to get it. They model how we can respond to God. After they Lee, the angels leave. They don't say to one another nonchalantly, why don't we check it out? I've got nothing else going on. How about you? The Bible tells us they went with great haste. They moved diligently, earnestly, or eagerly, rushing. We wouldn't use these words to describe a group saying, Let's go see what happened there in the, the manger, because we're mildly curious. Based on the context, they dropped everything, they were still terrified, and they moved with a great and heavenly purpose. Does the story suddenly get happy? Does it suddenly transform into the happy ending? If you've watched any holiday movie this season, any holiday movie, they all end with the person getting it. They finally go, aha, I know the true meaning of Christmas now. It doesn't shift that way in the gospel. Parents, all parents, want to keep their children clean and safe. This is especially difficult if the recovery room is a barn. Sometimes new parents go overboard. I, I remember, I'll confess, I, I went a little bit overboard when... Melanie and I had our first child, no hot beverages while holding the baby, no, uh, you, you know, you have to Purell or hand sanitize before getting within a, like a 10 foot radius. That's the first child. Here's Mary and Joseph with their first child and hand sanitizer hadn't even been invented yet. And now who shows up but a bunch of shepherds. When they arrived, they saw the one by whom and through whom all things were made. And in that unpretentious, grubby, fear-fueled setting, they had reached the core of the cosmos. 
They were gazing on the innermost heart of the universe. God made flesh. God all bountiful. God all creative. God incarnate. And this is good news. God who comes as a human to live among us in all our humanity is good news for us. Recognizing the depth of this story is a challenge when we're so familiar with it. Generally, we like to have a sanitized Jesus. We like the Christ child. I worked with a fellow in Chicago who was not a person of faith in any form or fashion, but he always used to like to tell me, I like the baby Jesus. That's the kind of Jesus I like. I don't like the grown-up one who wants to tell me how to live my life, but I like the feel-good baby Jesus. He was fond of saying that too. Oh, were you at church yesterday? Did you celebrate the baby Jesus? Said, well, not all year. That's only in December. The rest of the year we really look at the rest of his life. Recognizing the depth of the story is a challenge for us. We have to suspend our idea of the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Because if he was like any other baby, we wouldn't have a silent manger. We wouldn't have no crying. And that's good news. Because in the Savior's cries and tears, we meet his humanity. And in his humanity, we find redemption. The Bible has tidings of great joy. Not simply be happy or have a feel-good day. This is the joy that those gibbering, terrified shepherds experienced. It's profound, it's full, and it's life-giving. I don't know where you are on your journey tonight. I don't know what led you here. I don't know if it was a twisted arm or if it's habit or if this is where you would be given choices. But wherever you are on the journey tonight, this great joy of Christmas isn't something vaguely sentimental. It's not a feeling within us. It's not like, I love this movie, but it's not like it's a wonderful life where at the end Clarence does get his wings. Christmas is the story of God incarnate. Something happened at Christmas, and it can never be undone. God broke the heavens apart and poured God's self on the earth. God spoke to the world. It was a helpless and fragile word in the form of a baby in a barn in Bethlehem. It was a word of unexpected interruption. A word that establishes for good the difference between the God we would like and the God who actually comes to be with us. In the celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, I hope you don't have a happy Christmas. I hope you have a Christmas that is full of joy. A Christmas that is full of blessings. A Christmas that is full of the wonder of God pouring out God's self on your life. Amen.